Hey everyone, welcome back to our Add to Your Faith studies on the Synoptic Gospels. Um, sorry this video is a little bit late this week. We ended up going out of town for a day trip to the zoo. Um, if you follow me on Facebook, you know the, or Instagram, the pictures and everything we've been putting up. So um, I'm a little bit late this week, so sorry about that. Um, today we are looking at number 71, which is the Gettering Demoniacs. Now, this passage is found in Matthew, Mark, and in Luke. The Mark passage is the longest at 20 verses. So I'm going to read that one as it has uh, more information than the other two passages. Um, and we'll talk about some differences between the passages. But since they're really long, I'm not going to read all three for sense of time today. Um, but you can look at those from your chart. So we are in Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 1, and then reading through verse 20. Okay. Uh, they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him any more, not even with a chain. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains. But he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs, and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him, saying, Send us to the pigs, let us enter them. So he gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out, and entered the pigs, and the herd, numbering about two thousand, rushed down the steep bank into the sea, were drowned in the sea. Sorry, and were drowned in the sea. The herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country, and people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had had the legion, sitting there, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. And he did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends, and tell them how much the Lord has done for you, and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone marveled. Okay, now... The difference between the three passages in Matthew, Mark, and Luke is one key thing. In Matthew, it talks about two demon-possessed men at this account whose demons were cast into the pigs, um, whereas the Luke passage is very close to this one. Now, in research, the main concept that most people have about why Matthew has two demon-possessed men and Mark and Luke have one is the result of the exorcism. The one man who had the legion of demons, he wanted to follow Christ, whereas the other man apparently did not. And so Matthew gives us the information that there were two. But Mark and Luke focus on the one man who, after the demons are removed from him, wants to follow Christ and indeed becomes a missionary to the Decapolis, the Greek cities. So um, it's important that when we read something that's different in a passage, we don't automatically assume that there's some kind of um, disagreement or something wrong in the scripture. Scripture is never wrong. So when there's something different, we have to look at to why. So that additional information that's given doesn't mean that Mark and Luke were saying there's only one man. Uh, there was two men, but one of them was the focus of the story uh, for Mark and Luke. So um, let's get to the story itself. Now, one thing that is significant about this exorcism, this removal of, of demons, is that there was a legion of demons. Now, legion is a Roman uh, expression in military terms for the Roman military. 
a legion was 4,000 to 6,000 men. So when in the Roman army, it would say a legion of soldiers were going somewhere for Rome or fighting a battle, whatever. That was a group of soldiers that was four to 6,000 people. So when this demon says we are legion, um, because there are many, they they are literally many. Four to 6,000 demons were in this man. It was a, a legion, also can have the idea of a of that military term being used that it was a unit of of demons working together um, possessing this one man now obviously um, that made him crazy uh, to have so many spiritual beings living inside of him he was wild and excessively strong he was unable to be chained they could not contain him and him and the other man lived in the tombs um, making, uh, I believe it's Matthew that says that making that way unpassable. No one could go that way because of these evil men or almost creatures at this point that were living uh, in the mountain tombs or graves of this region. Now, Jesus comes by boat across the Sea of Galilee to this area and finds the way blocked by these demon-possessed men and as Matthew is telling the story and as Mark and Luke are telling the story, what they're revealing is that these men were a danger to themselves. They were a danger to the community. Um, they were uncontainable. And Jesus told the demons to come out. Now, when he did that, the demons began to beg him and the expression adjure by God. So trying to evoke the name of God to make Jesus not cast the demons out, which is so interesting just in the concept of demonology, these fallen angels who were kicked out of heaven because of their rebellion against God, they're siding with Satan, wanting to rule in God's place. Um, so when that rebellion happened, God cast those uh, angels out of heaven and they became the demons that we see in scripture and know of today. Now these evil forces that are uh, were angelic, but yet, unfortunately, due to their rebellion and fall from heaven, are the epitome of evil. They are anti-God, in the sense that they work against God and serve evil. They serve Satan. So, the, the reality is, I think, something we sometimes want to avoid is that demons exist, angels exist, the spiritual warfare is happening all the time around us. Um, but we also don't have to um, be overly focused on the spiritual world. God is in control of what's happening in the spiritual world. He tells us to be prepared for battle. I think one thing that happens um, where we make a mistake is if a Christian becomes overly obsessed with wanting to understand demons or even angels, wanting more information about the spirit world, researching into the occult and such, they're opening themselves up to a world that we have no power over. The Holy Spirit within us has power over all the spiritual realms. God is more powerful than anything that he created. Um, so therefore, a demon or an angel or anything else is not able to possess a Christian or overpower a Christian because the Holy Spirit, being God and the creator of those spiritual beings, is more powerful than them. So uh, we have no reason to fear them, but God tells us to be prepared for battle. That's when he says, put on the full armor of God. Um, that you can extinguish the fiery darts of Satan. When Satan is bringing temptation that our spiritual um, battle happens at, where we have to make a choice uh, between following God and the Spirit or following our lower nature, which is drawn to the sin that is offered to us. Um, we sin inherently. Satan does not make us sin. He simply offers us the opportunity and when we have our our spiritual focus on serving God and serving God's kingdom, then the temptations are weaker. But when we are living in self-indulgence, we have no discipline, we have no self-control, 
etc., then it's very easy to fall for the temptations because our lower nature is still strong and wants those things. So it's basically which one do we want more, the spirit or the flesh? The flesh being the world of sin and Satan and demons or God and his kingdom following Christ having the mind of Christ and living uh, in light or living in darkness. Those are always the choices that are before us. But as Christians, we cannot be possessed by a demon like these men were possessed. Only a soul that is dead and has not been sealed by the Holy Spirit can be possessed by a demon, which is very important. Uh, Jesus illustrated this when he says that a, um, a thief cannot come into a strong man's house uh, that concept that a strong man will never be overpowered by a weaker man. The Holy Spirit being the strongest cannot be overpowered by a demon or even a legion of demons. It doesn't matter how many demons they are. They're always created beings that are lower than God's power. So what is the spiritual world that we're supposed to be um, aware of and prepared for battle? Um I think if we live in denial that there's any kind of spiritual world and say, oh, there are no demons, that's myth, or there is no spiritual battle, then we're opening ourselves up to easily uh, be tripped up by the, as scripture says, the wiles of Satan. The, the, his wisdom is a wisdom of evil, a wile, uh, W-I-L-E, meaning uh, cunning or um, trickery. So Satan has the power to present something to look beautiful and full of light when it is evil and corrupted. And we either have God's eyes to see that evil thing clearly because we are armed with the armor of God, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, those things that are protecting our soul. Or we are not trying to protect ourselves spiritually, and so we're very open to Satan's trickery. Um, so be very careful. I, I know this is not exactly what this lesson's on, but because um, some Christians show a lot of interest in demonology, in witchcraft, in the New Age movement, in Wicca, and in several different forms of occult practice when trying to call on the powers of angels or of demons to use for their self, um, understand that that is not ever going to work. When you try to evoke the power of evil, that you think you in some way can control that or use that, which is what witchcraft and Wicca and all forms of white and black magic, all those things are trying to utilize, um, they may call it powers of nature or spirit powers or guardian angel powers, all these things. Um, do not get involved in those things because that is simply um, pursuing the satanic lust of power that he offers, um, that when you indulge in that is very, very evil. Um, there is literally nothing more evil than um, working with Satan, who is the opposite of God. So be very careful of that. In our world today, there's a lot of entertainment and um, reading and everything online. I mean, even Instagram that is focused on that kind of magic and um, spiritual power. So just be aware of what you're dealing with, that it is all connected to Satan. There is no good magic. There is no, um, like just because they use the word angels, it doesn't mean it's God's angels. Those are Satan's angels. They were literally angels, so that's not a lie, but it's not the whole truth. They are fallen angels who are demonic, and you do not want to be connected with them or open your home or your heart uh, to them. Um, and I would have to say that if you are able to open your heart or your home, your practice to demonic activity and you feel no conviction from the Holy Spirit, then you are very likely not sealed by the Holy Spirit because God will warn you with very strong warning against that kind of evil. And if you don't have any warning from it, um, then you could be possessed because you don't have the Spirit of God living within you. So be very careful uh, to know yourself and to know the dangers. Now, with that said, I always have to do a disclaimer on demons because um, we've had this discussion in our live Bible studies and in other um, situations where there's just so many questions about demons and angels and understanding the role that Satan has, why does he exist? There's a lot that um, could be taught on this topic. Uh, but 
I think it's very important that instead of knowing everything about evil, we should know everything about good. That whole analogy that's used about counterfeit money, um, when a bank person is being trained to recognize counterfeit money, they don't show them every possible kind of counterfeit bill. They teach them to be so familiar with the real bill that anything counterfeit stands out to them very clearly because they're so aware of truth and reality. Um, so the more true and reality-centered you are in Scripture, then the more evident things that are evil or wrong will stand out to you in clarity. Um, it's not... It's not wrong for us to know that these things exist, but it is wrong to obsess about them. Or, you know, some people have like entire Bible studies, um, like week after week, where they focus on understanding demons and understanding angels. And I would say that is very dangerous and not how God wants us to focus our hearts and our minds. He wants us to know scripture and to know him. He wants us to have a personal relationship with him. That's more important than any other spiritual training that we might could have. So just be careful with that. Now, again, as Jesus comes to these demons and he's rescuing these men from this demonic possession, um, they're trying to negotiate with Christ and beg him not to cast them into the abyss. Now, we understand uh, from Revelation and a few other passages about the abyss where all these evil creatures are that in the end times, some will be released uh, to bring parts of the tribulation onto the earth. Um, the This place is obviously really bad because even the demons are like, please don't send us there. <laughs> uh, how bad is it if the ultimate evil doesn't want to be there? Um, and so just side note, you don't want to be there either. Um, Christians are the only ones who can escape going to eternal punishment with all the evil that exists. Um, hell, the abyss, the lake of fire, different terms that we use for different places that will all be um, punished after the judgment. Again, another whole lesson there. But anyway, this place of punishment and jail of evil is not a place that you want to go. It was not made for you. It was made for the demons. However, uh, anyone who rejects Christ and does not receive the payment for their sins, that that is not offered to God in placement of me and my sins, if I do not have the blood of Christ washing my book clean, then I will have to be sent to the abyss. That's the concept, right? Hell is for those who are not redeemed. They are not paid for. Now, please hear that. Sometimes we don't talk clearly enough about what salvation is. Salvation is Jesus saving us from hell. He is paying the price of our sin so that we don't have to pay for it ourselves by eternal torture in hell. Now, again, the demons don't want to even go there, so they know what it is. Um, sometimes people laugh or tease, like, well, all my friends will be in hell, so I want to be there too. This is not a communal experience. It is an individual torture for eternity, non-ending torture, fire, worms eating you. There's all kinds of descriptions of what it's like to be tortured for eternity throughout scripture. Um, what we understand is clearly it is the worst thing that any soul can experience. To spare us that out of the love that God has for us, Jesus took that eternal torture in his deity. He could take that entire thing on the cross. Whereas we need unlimited time to pay for our sins, he was able to take the full punishment all at once for all of us. That's why the cross is so overwhelmingly horrifying that what Jesus experienced is all of our eternal torture. Now, remember, Scripture says the wages of sin, the payment of sin, is death. And the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now that death doesn't just mean my physical death. It is a word used for hell and punishment, eternal death. The payment of my sin is a death of my soul. And it is that dead soul that cannot live with Christ that is punished throughout eternity. Now sometimes these terms are hard to understand. Um, it is 
confusing in language. Like, well, if I'm already dead, then how am I tortured? I remember the spiritual world and the physical world are different. My physical body will die because of sin. Um, Adam and Eve hadn't sinned. We would all have eternal bodies, but they did sin. They brought our fallen nature, which is why we also choose to sin. And in that choice, our spirit is dead. And in that death, we cannot see life except through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, resurrecting our death to life. And once I am a living soul, sealed by the Holy Spirit, then I can be in heaven with God. Otherwise, I am destined to be with all the demons and evil that's ever existed, to be tortured throughout eternity for standing against God and trampling underfoot the blood of Christ. Now, these demons are begging Jesus, please don't send us there. Um, I, I wish that humans were just as afraid of going there as the demons are. Um, that said, the beautiful gift of salvation is heaven and a relationship with God. The terror of being lost, a person who is not a living soul is not being able to go to heaven. No matter what good you do, you're still dead. Um, it's the example of a zombie. If you know the zombie literature concept of a dead body that's reanimated and walking around and, you know, all the crazy stuff that is done with the zombies. But just one thing that's useful in that is we are like a zombie, a dead body walking around with nothing good that we can do um, if we don't have Christ. And so let's say that that zombie, like some of the TV shows that are out there, puts on the nice clothes and wears makeup and tries to hide the fact that they're a dead creature. Are they any less dead? No. It's the same with people who try to work their way to heaven. They try to hide their deadness behind going to church, singing beautiful worship music, giving money, whatever activity that they think is good and can earn merit with God, somehow earn God's favor, then they're trying to get to heaven. But as a friend of mine gave a good illustration this week, if we could earn our way to heaven, we are saying that Jesus' blood is not necessary. If Jesus had to die to pay for my sin, how could giving money to church or singing a couple of songs take the place of that blood sacrifice. It is simply a lie of Satan. So we must be very aware that being a Christian is in essential definition, someone who has gone from death to life, from a dead spirit to a living spirit. That's why Jesus described it in John 3 as being born again. Because we are born again. We start over a new beginning with a living spirit. But then the Holy Spirit seals that living spirit so that when we sin, we do not die again. Because the blood of Christ has paid for all of my sins, past, present, and future, and sealed me so that my spirit can then go to heaven, having been purchased by Jesus. Now that does not give us permission to sin, if we sin willingly, knowing that Jesus has paid for us, that presumptuous sin is very, very hard to ever remove, to confess, to be refreshed from. Um, it is a really bad choice to live that way and is brought into question again. If I can choose to sin, knowing that I'm sinning, knowing that I'm rebelling against God, and I have no conviction of that and no concern, then it's a question of, am I actually a living spirit? Or do I still have a dead spirit that is more inclined to sin than to, to Christ? Like Santos has been preaching on James, your faith will result in works. We never earn merit for our salvation with works, but works do come after salvation. I will do good things because the Lord is giving me his Holy Spirit, to move me and act in a way that he wants me to. That living spirit 
does what the spirit wants me to do rather than following what evil wants me to do. And if that is not an overarching pattern in our life, then there's a question about your actual salvation. Have you ever received the free gift of eternal life of that new living spirit? Or are you simply like a zombie, a dead body, decorating yourself with Christian behavior and never actually move from death to life? Now, I focus on that with this demoniac story because of what we see from the demon possession. These men were possessed by demons. Their only hope was to be rescued by Christ. The demons desperately don't want to leave these people or this area. They say, please don't send us away from here. Or the other passage, don't send us into the abyss. They desperately want to stay on earth, living in these people's bodies. And Jesus allowed them to go into the pigs. Now, that's an interesting thing that Jesus did. Jesus could have just cast them into the abyss, but instead he let them enter a herd of pigs. Now, I think one of the reasons that that is so essential is the pigs represent rebellion against God. The Jewish people were called to not be pig farmers. That was one of their rules to show that they were God followers. They lived differently than the people around them. And one of the rules of holiness that they were given was to not eat pig or to keep pigs as a creature in their home. When Jesus comes to this area, and it is a giant, obviously giant herd of pigs, because four to 6,000 demons go into them, um, and it is such a declaration by Christ that he not only got rid of that area's evil corruption that these demons brought, but he also got rid of the symbol of not following God and not living a holy lifestyle that those pigs represented. He got rid of it all at once. He got rid of both the demons and the pigs. Um, now, the people's responses varied. Like the Matthew, the two demoniacs, we don't know what happened to the other man who was rescued from the demons. He doesn't seem to be following Christ. That's why Mark and Luke tell us about the one who does. Um, the people in the region are all saying, please get out of here. Why? Because Jesus took away both the thing they were afraid of in those demoniacs, but also the thing that made them money, which was the pigs. They were obviously, as a culture, not concerned with serving God, wanting to be God-fearing Jews, or really that concerned about the demons, because instead of celebrating the fact, they were full of fear because Jesus' power was demonstrated, and they just wanted him away. People will respond to Christ in one of two ways, like the demoniac, who is rescued from this legion of demons, he wants to go with Christ. He wants to follow him. And instead, Jesus said, don't come with me. You go and you tell your, your home, your family, your people, what I have done for you. And that's what he did. He went and started declaring the good news that Jesus could rescue him from thousands and thousands of demons and that he also could be a salvation for his family and his friends. That should be our response to experiencing this new life of being given a living spirit is to respond with a declaration, a speaking the gospel to all the people around us. That was what Jesus told him to do. Or we can be like the other people who in this area were like, Jesus, go away. We don't want you taking away our money. We don't want you telling us to be more holy, like in driving out the pigs. We don't want you to show your power here and remove evil from us. You leave. We either go with Christ and we go declaring the gospel or we want God to leave us. Which one is more true about your home, about your work, about your friendships, about your lifestyle? Are you following Christ, going with him and going on the mission, the call that he gives you to declare the gospel to others? Or is your lifestyle saying, God, I really don't want you here. I want you to leave. Um, if you walked around your home and you said, God, how um, how am I declaring the gospel with my home? How am I speaking my faith and my uh, allegiance to Christ in the way that I have friends, the way that I have my home, the way that I live my life? Are you living saying, Jesus, I want you. I want to go with you. I want to speak the gospel like this demoniac. Or are you like the people left behind saying, God, please get away from me. I don't want your conviction. I don't want your cleansing. I don't want your holiness. Um, I hope that 
in this lesson today that we can really be aware of what God wants to do in our individual lives. Um, are you living your life free from demon obsession, possession, oppression, any of those things? Have you opened yourself up in any way to demonic activity? Then you need to confess that and forsake it. There is no place in a Christian home for the occult or for demonology of any kind. Do not waste your time trying to pursue power that has already been taken away from them. Follow the one who created them and who offers you eternal, everlasting life and the power of the Holy Spirit, which is, again, more powerful than Satan. But see, God doesn't offer us power for our pride or power for our money. He offers us power to worship him and to serve him, to have peace and love and joy. Whereas Satan offers the temptation of a power that looks more about self and pride, evil, money, etc. So what are you pursuing? Are you living your life pursuing money and power? Then that's a demonic mentality. Are you living your life pursuing love, joy, peace, fellowship, unity, the gospel? Then that's a spiritual mentality. And are you doing it because you're a living soul that has given yourself to God? Or are you a dead soul that's simply decorating yourself while still being dead? I hope that for everyone watching, and I know we have people watching in so many different countries, which is exciting, um, but it also can be confusing because you're simply watching, but you can't ask very many questions. Um, so I try to cover the different points for wherever you are and whoever you are. Uh, but this, the most important thing that a person can answer is, what is the state of my soul? Am I living a new beginning, a living soul, a new birth, sealed by the Holy Spirit and living for righteousness, serving Jesus? Or am I a dead soul that is living with no control, simply trying to earn merit because I don't recognize the blood of Christ? Or are you that third group, those Jewish people who um, were religious in mentality, but they had this demon-possessed region, they had these pigs that they were allowing a lack of holiness, and they really didn't want Jesus around them. They didn't want God in their life. I hope that all of us can reconcile our hearts with this message today and determine that you are truly a born-again Christian who is serving Christ, declaring the gospel, and living free from any demonic influence. And if that's not true, then it's simply confess, believe, while admitting that you're a sinner. Um, you have to admit that you need Christ and there's no merit or anything you can do to earn salvation. You have to believe that Jesus Christ is God, that he truly died on the cross and paid for your sins, and that he came back to life. And you must confess him as Lord and Savior, asking him to save you. Now, that faith and grace are gifts from God. Faith comes from hearing, hearing by the word of God. Grace is that unmerited favor that God gives us that makes us able to respond to his faith that is given to us from the word. Receiving that free gift is your choice. Will you receive the free gift of eternal life by grace through faith, or will you try to do it your way, a more demonic method? I hope that everyone chooses Christ. And if you have any questions about how to truly confess him, how to make sure that you are a living soul, how to deal with any doubt or fear or shame or guilt that you're facing, please message me. Please feel free to contact me um, here on Facebook, Internet, Methods. There's all kinds of stuff. You can email me. You can Instagram me. You can Facebook me. You can find here on YouTube. But please don't just walk away from this video and say, hmm, I think I'll just stay with the demons. Uh, don't do that. <laughs> Look at this story. Consider the impact of the demon power and how evil and horrible it was. And make sure that you are not toying with the edges of that, but be set free to walk in the glorious light of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, our ladies here in Korea, um, I am really hoping that we can soon have our our messages together, our Bible study together. Um, I know it's supposed to be two more weeks 
again before uh, we're allowed to assemble. Um, it's what we got from the church th th yesterday. So I'm not sure when we'll be allowed to meet together, but I'm hoping it's soon. Uh, everyone stay strong. Keep working on your faith. Don't give up or be discouraged during this time. And let's meet together soon and worship him together. All right, God bless. Bye.